I'm Katie Massad, and this is Flute Unscripted. I sit down with a new artist every week and share their uncensored stories with you. You're listening to Season 2, brought to you by Flute Center of New York, the exclusive marketplace for flutes. Join us and subscribe, and please stay tuned to the end of the episode for a very special Flute Center of New York code for our podcast listeners. one of the most famous and recognizable names in jazz flute. Nestor Torres has released 14 albums as a soloist, has been a featured flutist at a number of jazz festivals and orchestral concerts, and has collaborated with other notable artists, such as Herbie Hancock, Paquito de Rivera, Dave Matthews, and Gloria Estefan. Nestor Torres brings the precision and excellence of classical training, along with his Latin flair, to the jazz flute idiom and joined me after a jam session at the Flute Center of New York to talk about his unique sound and his vision for the future of music. Thank you, Nestor, for coming and sitting down with me today. It's a real pleasure. Uh, my, my pleasure and delighted to be here and thank you for inviting me to, to join all of you. Great. Uh, you've come a long way since being a 12-year-old learning the flute in Puerto oh, Rico. Oh, yes, quite a long way. To a Grammy-winning artist. Yes. And before then, I was a drummer. You know, Santa oh, Claus really? brought me a small set of drums when I was five. Wow. It was a small set, but it was a professional set. Mm. So it was not until, uh, you know, from five to 12, I was playing drums, and then I had the you know, opportunity to learn flute, and yeah, the rest And you left the, the drums behind. He said so long. Gradually, yeah, yes, oh, okay. I did, yes. <laughs> you have certainly um, led a really impressive career. You mm. started off studying classically. Yes. Um, and doing some jazz mm-hmm. in the meantime um, at Manus, NEC, Berkeley. Yes. Did you have anybody else, any colleagues at the same time that were doing anything similar to what you were doing with these dual pursuits? And were there any faculty members or mentors that you had that were encouraging you to do both? Or hmm. was it tough? No. Uh, no, there was no... Um, there was, at the time, there was no point of reference for me to do that. Mm-hmm. Although, you know, of course, you know, Hebert Law's when I heard his work, that's what inspired me to really seriously pursue classical Mm -hmm. training. Uh, He showed what was possible. So uh, although I did not know anyone personally, but Hubert was the one that that set the standards, both in terms of virtuosity, as well as the possibilities of combining uh, uh, different genres, in this case, of of course, classical music with jazz. So I seek that out. Um, At the same time, my interests have always been very varied. Uh, I enjoy classical music. I enjoy Latin music, salsa. I grew up with it. Of course, you know, jazz by virtue of the instrumental component. Uh, my father was a musician, so, you know, he, he was also a great influence, you know, listening to records like Stan Getz and, and Bongo yeah. Santa Maria on the one hand and Dave Brubeck. So I had that, you know, in, in my environment. And so that eclecticism... Um, it, it, that surrounded me, and then eventually Hubert Loss's uh, inspiration brought you know set me on that journey. Mm-hmm. Um, now today is it not only a normal thing, but it's expected that musicians yeah, we have to do everything, exactly, every genre, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but not at that time. So it was pretty much of a of a long journey, and it was not a journey that was planned. I, mm-hmm. it's, it's not something that oh, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to pursue. Well, that's not true. Because you're just making me remember that I'm remembering my audition at Manus School of Music. I had just come, you know, fresh uh, have come up from Puerto Rico in June, and then of course I auditioned to be in that fall. Uh, and they asked me, you know, well, what do you, what do you want to do? What are your aspirations? And I just very, like for a teenager, very kind of. Uh, uh, not brassly, but you know, very very confident. Yeah. yeah. So, well, you know, I want to be, you know, during the day when I be in the recording studio, uh, uh, doing you know uh, jazz or different kinds of music. Then early in the evening, I want to go play classical music, and late at night, I'll play salsa or Latin music. Mm-hmm. So I knew that I wanted to be able to do different kinds of of music. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so I guess I did. I just did not know how right. how it would really uh, 
come about. It was just an idea. And eventually life led me so that that's what I ended up doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you would think that you would be able to do all those things here in New York, but you moved to Miami. Yes. Um, the Miami move came about as a result of different things. Interestingly, uh, as to be expected, my colleague said, Nestor, you're crazy. You know, you need to be here or you need to be in Los Angeles. But um, <clears throat> having, born, having been born and raised in Puerto Rico, uh, at the beginning, it was exciting to have to wear coats and scarves and all that, <laughs> and the snow and, and so on. But after the endless slush and endless yeah, gray that's always days the hardest nights, part. That that like February to yeah. to May area is just it gray was and very slushy. yeah, very difficult. Very it was difficult for yeah. me to adapt. Um, but most importantly, I had a work opportunity. I had a career opportunity. It was mm-hmm. a very it was a Latin band at the time that I was playing with, and they decided to relocate to Miami. They had a lot of work. And to me, so it was a, a logical choice, although in retrospect, you know, uh, you know, you always pay a price. No, let me rephrase that. You always have to deal with the consequences of the decisions you make. Mm-hmm. And I can see that, you know, had I stayed in New York, uh, my career would have taken a, a, a different path. Uh, at the same time, because I moved to Miami, my music and what I was able to develop artistically is exactly what it needed to be. I couldn't have... The music of Nestor Torres would not be the music of Nestor right. Torres had I stayed in New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it wouldn't have been... Although I love the city. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, you also, there are a lot of other things that kind of came with moving down there. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, your career blossomed, and then mm-hmm. in the, the 90s, you had a, yes. an accident, right? Oh, boy. Yeah. That was a, yes. Um, we were working quite a bit more. The first jazz record was a great success. We were in the process of getting ready to do uh, our second record. Uh, and this is during the time in which, you know, uh, Kirk Russell and Chuck Norris... Don Johnson, you know, these guys were very popular and they were doing this offshore power boat, offshore racing. And I was asked to do a preliminary race, you know, from the local celebrities kind of uh, race in the intercoastal area. I had never driven or or steered a boat. I was, I have never been a sportsman or an athlete for that matter. But they asked me to do it. And, And so I thought it'd be exciting, you know, um, so I said, yes, make a long story just yeah. a bit longer. On the very first course that I was t- making the turn, I got in the way of another boat, which hit my boat from behind. Then from what I heard, went up in the air and then fell right on me. Mm. And that left me with 18 fractures in my ribs, both broken clavicles, a collapsed lung. And uh, even the, the the left shoulder blade, they, they call that bone the scapula, mm-hmm. I found out that it's a very hard bone to break. I remember in the midst of coming in and out of consciousness, uh, the, the guys from the x-rays taking x-rays, they were saying, oh man, look at this, you know. This is the, 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 because uh, Because allegedly the scapula is a very, very difficult wow. bone to fracture. And, and so everything I had been working Towards, you know, it's imagine having a beautiful table set up with china and plates and beautifully decorated, and just somebody just comes over and just completely mm-hmm. wipes it out. And so I had to start from zero. Yeah. Well, and I didn't bring up this whole story to make you rehash bad memories, but I was really interested in how you've the rebuilding part. Mm-hmm. Um, and do you think that it was? more challenging um, physically and mentally to rebuild knowing how how far you had already come mm-hmm. versus being a newcomer hmm. I would think it's almost mm-hmm. more disheartening because you know you know you've already right. reached such heights and now you have right. to kind of start over well I, I was you know was it more difficult to start over or rather than as if I had re- yeah. just started from zero I was not thinking in those terms I, I did not think in those terms. Uh, what what happened was happening, and yeah. that's what I needed to deal with. You knew <clears> that <throat> you were going to pick the flute back up. Uh, it was the, for for a while. It was debated whether or not yeah. that was going to happen. Uh, but I have to say, in answer to your question as to how I came back and you know how I was able to 
covering come come through um i have to give a lot of uh credit to my buddhist practice you mm-hmm. know of nam myoho renge kyo and, and a, a, a philosophy of of value creation and with uh, in which you're able to develop uh, you know bring forth or develop and never give up spirit yeah um and and one thing is to uh embark on a path that teaches certain principles and values and you 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 do your best to live by them it is another when you're really impacted with a traumatic situation mm-hmm. like the one i went through and then okay so what are the tools that you have available and that's when i really discovered the power of of having a correct philosophy of life because rather than and i and i went through this process you know when i was really down really depressed trying to practice a little bit here and there my personal situation was so there was there were elements of betrayal in, yeah you also went through a divorce at the same time uh, as all of this. it was yeah. <clears throat> very 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 difficult and at my lowest moments i uh <clears throat> i wondered you know what you know man that the how low it was and then i remember the two thoughts that came to mind one was like it can always be worse and this was not encouraging it's just like you know it, it can always get worse and but this is as low as I, as i can imagine it and the second thought was okay well life is win or lose and that's it it's t- one of those two choices or possibilities and um, at that moment so you know what all oh, i'll just take one of them off the table mm mm-hmm. There is no option other than to move forward. Yeah. <clears throat> there was no there's no choice but to continue. So and also prior to that immediately after the incident uh I remember waking up in the hospital and really backed up and whatnot. the person that I was married to at that moment she was right by there and I remember up saying, "Oh, I guess I'm pretty messed up, huh?" So it was not about Oh my gosh, what happened? How could this be? Why me? How come this is what am I going to do now? That sense that no, it was like, oh, this is what I need to deal with. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, okay, this this is the challenge at hand. And um and an, another thing too, um it, in, in conclusion, unless there's anything else you want to ask about that, but I was going to ask if you think it influenced your playing at all. Do you think you were a different flutist? Well, yes. Not just um not just the mechanics of playing, mm-hmm. but your artistry or your sound, yes. your vision. Well, my my vision and my sense of purpose in terms of my music and I'll yeah. tell you uh uh how what that was. It was about the nurses. You know. Here I was in not quite intensive care, but it was under constant. It was like what they called it the mini unit mm-hmm. at the time. And so I was constantly, you know, um uh, uh medicated with morphine. So it was a little bit of a trippy, you know, right. experience to it, but here I am laid up, you know, I hear patients screaming and complaining. Uh then doctors would come in 5 minutes, leave. But the nurses were there constantly. I couldn't do anything. They were bathing me, taking care of me, they would feed me, you know. And they were present, they were professional, they were compassionate. You know, and in the meantime I'm thinking, you know, there you know, the doctors get their credit and they get paid the money. Yep. Uh these people are getting grief from the patients all the time. The doctors don't really appreciate or have this kind of dynamic. So I'm experiencing that and then it, I thought, well, here I am, a star or a, a celebrity or successful I by then I was doing mostly concerts. I was not really doing that many clubs, you know. Uh which means, you know, at a at a at a concert you play from 8 to 9:30 yep. at the most, you know. Yeah. So now I'm a half. I you know, if you really have to work very hard at a club, at the very most, you would I mean, when you're getting started, you know, play, working the hardest, you do three sets in yeah. a night, which means from 8 to midnight or 10 to to in the morning like and you do that job and doing something that you enjoy doing and you get up you know you receive the applaud and adulation and appreciation yeah. and and oh because I'm a star or or a celebrity and so I looked at my work and my life and in my professional in my professional life 
And then I looked at these nurses and I said, you know what, in terms of these are women, these are people that are doing a work eight to 12 hours a day. Nobody, nobody thanks them. Nobody appreciates them. They're not getting paid as much as they should. Mm -hmm. You know what? And they're there too for the patient. That sense of caring and that sense of service. To me, say, you know what? That's that's what I want to be. That's that's who I want to be as an artist. That sense of service and and so less transactionary, care. not giving a performance and getting something. In the right. Room. It was yeah. about healing, you know. And so that that's what you know that the the accident really transformed my my attitude and my approach to my performances and. Mm the ability and the privilege of being able to make music yeah so are your performances a little bit more satisfying you say these days than well the, the, or in a different way the you know the the performances artists are satisfying in as much as i'm able to come from a place of service hmm. a place of offering rather than okay let me show you how right. great i am yeah, yeah. rather you know a, 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 my performance is about a, um, an offering of my talent and the musical experience to the audience and beyond that an experience of uh, sharing yeah uh, in that the exchange between the artist and the audience is what creates the experience and the music mm -hmm. uh, imagine the greatest most impeccable uh, instrumentalist or singer or whatever doing unbelievably amazing music in their own room in the practice room and there's nobody there to listen. There's nobody there to receive that mm -hmm. other than themselves. Uh, you know, I dare say that that can be a bit limited. Nestor overcame the struggles of having to rebuild his career and continues to share his music with others in a way that is meaningful to him. With his debilitating boating accident and later the 9-11 attacks, Nestor found that things are really put into perspective. He has gravitated towards Buddhism and found purpose in thinking of performing as a service to others and a means to connect. And you were talking about Buddhism before. Yes. Um, you also performed for the Dalai Lama yes. in 2010. Can you talk about that experience? How did that come to be? Well, actually, I got to play for him twice. Oh, Once wow. in, in 2004. And then again in 2010, um, uh, Nathan Katz, uh, Dr. Nathan Katz is a dear friend and he had been a director of the Department of Religious Studies at Florida International University. He had uh, also started the Center for the Study of Spirituality and I was part of the board of directors of the organization. He was instrumental, he had the relationship with His Holiness uh, and because of his relationship is that the Dalai Lama came to Florida mm -hmm. on a number of occasions. And so for that visit in 2004, uh, Dr. Katz asked me if I would compose a piece and perform it uh, on the occasion of the lecture that the Dalai Lama was to give in, in, in at Florida International University. Now, I practice a, Jap a form of Japanese Buddhism, which is Nichiren Buddhism, based on the Lotus Sutra, invocation of the title of it, and so on and so forth. And it, we're pretty specific as to be focused on that practice. So I, I consulted, I, I chanted, I mean, I prayed about it. I consulted with my elders in faith and, you know, doctrinally, how does this work? This is, not a, this is your profession, this is what you need to do, that's fine. And so I wanted to honor His Holiness by doing something that would be relevant to Buddhism, but it would be true to who really I am in terms of my practice. And so that's how the composition uh the Lotus Sutra of the Wonderful Law came to be, uh, which is based on, on some passages of, of the Lotus Sutra, as well as in the uh, recitation of, of, of such passages, which make part of the practice that we do, and the invocation of the title, which is Namo Hodeng Yakil. So uh, it was an amazing thing. Um, I When I met him, the first time mostly, just before our, uh, the event started, just before I went on stage, I met. He was so genuinely warm. It was his humanity that really I uh, was very touched by, uh, as opposed to his surroundings, for which, which were not as <laughs> such, you know, and the people around. But it was a great, immense honor to be able to perform, uh, and you know, for him and open the way that way, which reaffirmed 
to me the purpose also of music. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that response was so great that people clamored for a recording of that performance, which we eventually did. Good. And it's been released on an album called Dances, Prayers, and Meditations for Peace. Um, then a few years later, he came back and I was invited once again to perform. And this time I performed something that was in the same record that includes Dances, Prayers, um, the Little, the Little Sutra of the, of the Wonderful Law. And here it is, the Dalai Lama at a synagogue. And here I was performing my composition, St. Peter's Prayer, which was inspired, you know, out of, in the aftermath of 9-11. I mm -hmm. went to different houses of worship here in New York. You just improvise trying to capture something. And you're supposed to accept a Grammy That's on 9-11. I was in Los Angeles, you know, excited for the Latin Grammy Academy, uh, Latin Grammy Award Ceremony. And it was on September 11, which of course it didn't yeah. happen. Yeah. And that affected me deeply because I had so I was so excited f uh, about my nomination, and I was really looking forward to it. And I was really it was really all about the Grammys and planning to go to Los Angeles and you know and so on and so forth. Um, and then it didn't happen because of the obvious tragedy. And so what hit me about that was the futility and the meaninglessness of an award at a moment like that. Yeah. And so I figured, you know, what good does it do to for me to be honored like this if my work cannot contribute to, you know, keep these things from happening in yeah. the future. And so that stayed with me and that's when I decided, you know, I gotta do something. So let me just go to houses of worship, you know. A Catholic, you know, church near Ground Zero, a synagogue in the West Village, you know, uh, the New York uh, uh, Community Church on Park Avenue, of course, you know, the uh, Sokodakai Buddhist Center in New York. And I improvised, trying to capture it. And, and a lot of that material is included in, in the record Dance Express and Meditations for Peace. And uh, St. Peter's Prayer is one of them. So back to the story of the 2010 event with the Dalai Lama. The event was about that. It was about interfaith dialogue. Um, and heavens knows that it's so important for us to have a dialogue. You, mm -hmm. you know, we have to really not just have dialogue, but to, to really change it, transform the dialogue, what I call the third dialogue. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can talk forever about it, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, you have you have a yeah. knack of asking questions that yeah. just unleash all come so many different <laughs> thoughts and things, and one thing leads to the other. So yeah, yeah, my, yeah. My, I appreciate your being such a good listener, and I'm sorry that no, it's I great. Carry on endlessly. Oh, I, I love it. It's good stuff to mm -hmm. work with. Mm -hmm. um, in the spirit of always moving forward and looking forward, can we talk about the future of jazz music specifically? Mm. Because a lot of people say. Jazz, as we know it, is dead, you know, oh, hard yes. bop, bebop. Um, is it maybe more moving in the direction of new compositions? Is that the future? Or do you think we should be clinging to old styles? Well, I, I, I think that question can apply to both jazz as well as Western European music or what we know yeah, as classical yeah. music. Is jazz dead? I have heard it said that it is. But I heard that jazz is dead like 25 years ago. <laughs> right, right been dying for and a long time. <laughs> exactly and and there are more and more young people learning and even Juilliard <clears throat> the 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 uh, paragon of you know the ivory tower of classical Western European tradition is does have a jazz department now yeah you know so that doesn't seem to me like jazz music is dying what what really is changing is a reality and it hasn't really changed because jazz musicians have been struggling to make a living for a very long time like classical musicians struggle yeah. to make a living for a long time you know being a musician is difficult to be a professional musician is very difficult and so what needs to change is the paradigm and the way in which we think uh, as artists which it already is with social media right now young you know musicians and artists you know, many of them are getting DMAs, you know. So here you have someone with a, you know, with a doctoral degree, you know, in their mid-20s. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, they do about social media, they know about marketing, they're about recording, so many different things that they're able to do. And that's what has to happen for an artist. 
But <clears throat> most importantly, I think that the, what is timeless is the function of art and culture in our societies, uh, which is to communicate, to bring the best out of us. That even when it's music that is, you know, reflects conflict and chaos, that there's a form of expression that in, in some way allows us to really transform any situation. Um, I, and I'm taking a... I'm taking a philosophical approach to the question of whether what, what, what the, the direction of jazz is about, because you know, in order to be to find practical answers, you really have to go to to the basic belief systems of what that is, and I come back to the sense of service, your you know, interaction with an audience. Uh, very profound, difficult questions. The, the, yeah, the, the yeah. direction of jazz. I mean, well, I'm just wondering if we need to hear more people playing standard charts and doing the same solos, or if we need to hear more people writing new music. Oh, okay, I see. Well, I think it's both. Um, I think it's both uh, because you know, for example, one of the best, if not the best-selling jazz record ever is Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. Yep. Timeless. I mean, and he has such a quality. And yet Miles moved forward and beyond that, like to the point that he was criticized because he didn't stay doing that. I mean, so... You can't win no matter what you So do. he yeah. kept growing, you know, and uh, I think that just like the works of Beethoven and Mozart and Mahler and so on need to be kept alive, Mm -hmm. There is great value to to in, you know the in the interpretations and reinterpretation of, of of jazz standards. In fact, one of my productions, my most recent production, is jazz jazz flute traditions, in which I honor different uh, uh, you know the, the the pioneers of jazz flute, such as Herbie Mann and Hubert Laws, Eric Dolphy, Russell Lowe, and Kirk, Frank West, and so on and so forth. And indeed, I might make my own contribution in that I put my stamp on the Cold Porter uh, standard from a Broadway show, So In Love, as well as an old song called Miami Beach Rumba, you know, in my own flair. But, you know, I <coughs> jazz and playing the old standards is, is, a, is, a, is a way of expression that it is old to those who know about it, but for a 15 or 17-year-old that discovers it, yeah. They're, they're loving it. They're passionate about it. <clears throat> it's a new way to explore it. You know, in fact, I was in Cleveland, in Akron, actually, at the Blue Jazz Club. At that time, I was also speaking with uh, a gentleman pianist that teaches jazz, and we were having this conversation about how it is that, you know, it's all un un good to really play jazz, but it's, it, it, you know, if you try to really do only that, then you're limiting yourself. Mm. And furthermore, if you're limiting yourself to doing that without caring or being aware of what service or what does it, you know, who, who enjoys that music and how do you market it and so on and so forth, you're setting up yourself for, for failure and disappointment. Right. Um, so, I, I, you know, the musician of the 21st century, the instrumentalist of the 21st century needs definitely to continue playing jazz, but to have a glass of tradition. And what is your background, you know? In my case, I, I, I'm from Puerto Rico, so I have the whole Latin thing going on. Even though I love playing tango from Latin America, but then again, I was working with Miriam Agrod, which is a, a Turkish flutist that loves Latin jazz, and we mix it all up. Um, I don't know. What Just do you think? Awareness. Well, I, I really like what you said about mm. being aware of what's going on, and it's fine to play whatever whatever you want to play, but mm. still be conscious to everything else that's going around. Exactly. Yeah. And, and if anything, in conclusion, I think, uh, regarding that question of whether or not jazz is dead, uh, it comes down to the question of, of the heart, like to the mm -hmm. question of intention. Uh, and it could be, I mean, oh boy, down the rabbit hole we I go. Know, I know. Philosophy <laughs> about jazz music. Because then I'm thinking of pop. hand in hand. Yeah. But, but I'm also thinking of pop music yeah. and how how sterile it can be yeah. when you actually manufacture a hit yeah. and you do music that way and hits the lives of people a certain way what gives life to music or to a genre to you know it's, it's, it's the intangible everlasting yeah. question yeah
Thank you, Nestor. Thank so much. you. Listening to Nestor Torres perform and talking with him about some of these big questions we all ask ourselves regarding the relevance of our music, it is easy to see why he is such an interesting artist and influential figure. There is no question that Nestor is a mentor to young jazz flute newcomers and will continue to inspire generations to come. Thank you, Nestor Torres. Music selections feature songs from his albums, Nouveau Latino and This Side of Paradise. This has been an episode of Flute Unscripted. This podcast is sponsored by the Flute Center of New York. Visit their website at flutesforsale.com for the largest selection of new and pre-owned instruments. Use this season's promo code LISTEN for a special deal of $50 off any purchase of $4.99 or more. You can follow the Flute Center on Instagram and like them on Facebook to stay up to date on the latest events and masterclasses. Special thanks to our owner Phil Unger, the Flute Center team, and Stefan Huskoldsen for our theme music. <laughs>